Well, thank you to Reinhold, Chris Adams, uh, the entire knee team for making meniscus a priority. My name is Aaron Critch from the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and we're going to talk about meniscus root repair pearls and innovative inside-out repair techniques. I'd also like to acknowledge my partner, Dr. Michael Stewart, as we've developed some of these concepts together. So our preferred meniscus root repair technique is the transportal transtibial pull-through technique in which we create an anatomic socket with a flip cutter, two to three cinch sutures using the O-fiber link, and tibial fixation using a swivel lock. So what have we learned in the past two years of using this technique? Well, what was once a silent epidemic is now becoming common. 10 to 21% of meniscus repairs presenting to our clinic are in fact root tears. We still see the rapid progression of chondral degeneration with an untreated meniscus root tear. And now we're recognizing more and more with this publication by Freddie Fu and AJSM this month that the lateral meniscus posterior root tear increases knee laxity in the ACL deficient knee by one plus grade. While the medial root is easy to see on MRI and visualize, the lateral meniscus root remains a challenge. One in three cases at our institution was missed on preoperative MRI. Therefore, with the lateral root, it's often an arthroscopic diagnosis. Take this an acute ACL tear and a seemingly normal lateral compartment until the posterior horn root is probed and you can see a complete traumatic avulsion. So you always must be prepared in these cases. In my opinion, the best way to be prepared is to have the root repair kit available. Your circulating nurse can open up one package. You can very efficiently perform your root repair and 10 minutes later be on with other parts of the surgery. So some pearls. First, you need to create a space. On the medial side, you often have a very tight compartment. We don't want to destroy the cartilage we're trying to save. So in this case, we perform an MCL lengthening by placing the knee in valgus and perforating the femoral side of the MCL to create a grade two opening, taking this from mission impossible to something that's very accomplishable. We've also been using the power rasp to perform a reverse notch plasty of the medial femoral condyle and resecting the medial tibial spine. You can't fix what you can't see. It also creates a working space for us, and it also provides bony bleeding biology at the repair site. It's important to hit the target. If you don't restore the anatomy, you won't restore the biomechanics. We prefer the root repair guide. Its advantages being the concave design to get it underneath the condyle. The marking hook hooks the back of the tibia. Adjustable pin placement allows for patient variation in anatomy. The swivel handle avoids torque and coalescence when uh, performing concomitant procedures. And reliable two-point fixation allows you to hit the target. So here's an axial cross-section of the tibia. The transtibial root guide is designed to hook the posterior aspect. If you're coming more anterior into the PCL fossa, then your guide is also going to have a pin that's placed more anteriorly. So again, hook the posterior aspect of the tibia, you'll hit the target. If you're coming forward in the PCL fossa, your pin will be anteriorly. So here's what it looks like on a sawbones model. We hook the back of the tibia, we tamp down the step guide. We prefer to use a three pint five millimeter pin first and you hit your target. This is the typical posterior hook. If you come anteriorly into that PCL fossa, then your pin will also come anteriorly, and we hear this is a common uh, issue. Avoiding coalescence is easy with the transtibial root guide. Once you hook the back, you have complete degrees of freedom, both based on the angle as well as the swivel handle to avoid coalescence. That allows you to do cases like this. Here's a 25-year-old with acute ACL tear, lateral meniscus, and medial meniscus root tear. Here we perform lateral meniscus, transtibial pull-through root repair technique, same on the medial side, and reconstruct the ACL all in the same setting. Here's a patient that requires a valgus-producing proximal tibial osteotomy with the eye balance, ACL reconstruction, and medial meniscus root repair, again, all in one setting because the swivel handle allows you to avoid coalescence. We place easy cinch sutures using the knee scorpion with O-fiber link. If you place the loop on your knee scorpion first, it's a very fast and efficient way to pass your sutures. 
We just finished enrollment in our prospective multi-center trial with 45 patients, all getting the same technique with the anatomic socket with the flip cutter, two to three simple cinch sutures, and tibial fixation using the swivel lock. Here's six-month MRI follow-up on one of our patients where you can see the bone edema, mild extrusion of the lateral side before, and at six months, resolution of the bone marrow edema, and actually improvement in some of the extrusion we're seeing on the lateral side. Here's SOS data on those 45 patients at one year, improvement in Q scores, improvement in Lysholm scores, and improvement in pain scores. So for the medial meniscus, or for root repair in general, you need to simplify the transtibial repair technique by making the diagnosis, be prepared, have a root kit available, make a space, hit the target using the transtibial guide, avoid coalescence using the swivel technique, and enjoy the results. We're gonna move on to innovation with inside-out meniscus repair. I think it's important to take a step back and ask what's essential for the meniscus to heal, and that's anatomic reduction, biologic preparation, and circumferential compression, or what I call the ABCs of meniscus repair. If we look at circumferential compression, when we typically place the uh, all-inside device, we're compressing the femoral side of the meniscus tear. Oftentimes, we're gapping open the tibial side of the tear, which allows ingress of synovial fluid. And you get MRIs that look like this, where you can't tell, is it torn, is it healed? It's probably only partially healed. In this case, we use stacked vertical mattress sutures as a way to provide circumferential compression in this vertical longitudinal tear. Here's a follow-up MRI that shows complete healing. We all know the advantages of the traditional inside-out technique being smaller perforations with the needle, greatest strength of any meniscus repair technique, the greatest flexibility, and versatile. You can provide any stitch configuration. The disadvantages are that you often need two assistants, and it can be time-consuming. Fortunately, that's improved with the zone navigator. The zone navigator is an ergonomic needle advancement handle. One other advantage is that you can rotate these 360 degrees to very accurately place needles through your inside-out incision, allowing a very efficient repair. The second advantage is you can hit all zones of the meniscus. So here is a lateral meniscus from the contralateral portal with a post of a cannula. You can see access from the root all the way across the posterior horn of that meniscus. With the anterior cannula, you have complete access to the anterior horn and body of that meniscus, making it very simple. I think about traditional meniscus repair devices being able to do one thing. Inside out allows you to do everything, stack vertical mattress, horizontal mattress, circumferential compression, complex radial, complex multiplanar tears. Here's a case with a isolated bucket handle tear that involves all zones of the meniscus. So you could perform all inside, outside in, a variety of techniques, but why don't you just perform inside out for the entire meniscus? So it's important to anatomically reduce that meniscus. Your first stitch is your most important stitch. And with inside out, we can stack vertical mattress sutures, access the tibial side, so you get circumferential compression all the way to the anterior horn of the meniscus. And here's a one-year follow-up MRI, complete healing, complete return of function. Here's the zone navigator placing stacked vertical mattress sutures. Again, as you advance the needle uh, one centimeter with each button click, another advantage is the small perforation. So you only have a one millimeter perforation using your meniscus needle, and these are loaded with mini suture tape. So that allows a very precise, very anatomic placement of your needles, and the suture tape provides dispersion of forces across your repair site. So overall, a very large advantage. You can then dial in your tension by simple knot tying um, through your incision. Typically, it was very difficult to place sutures on the tibial side of the meniscus, but with inside out, it's very simple. We looked at our clinical results at 17-year follow-up, so long-term follow-up, 72% success rate, and excellent IKDC scores. What about radial tears? We all know that radial tears are particular bad actors because as we go through the peripheral circumferential fibers, we lose our ability to resist hoop stress. Here's a football player that presents with a full thickness radial tear, and here's a simulation in the lab showing what zone navigator can do for this repair type. So first of all, you can provide very precise placement of your suture needle. Again, a one millimeter perforation. 
In this case, we're gonna perform a cruciform or crossing stitches across our radial repair site. The other advantage of small perforations is that you can provide many sutures across the repair site. So we'll play sutures both on top as well as on the bottom of this meniscus repair. Here you can see with knot tying, you can dial in the amount of compression you want across your repair site. Again, that first stitch, most importantly, to get that anatomic reduction and allow for that circumferential compression. So here we're finishing the femoral side. Again, each button click is one centimeter of needle advancement. You can also back up the needle if you wish, uh, but again, it allows a very precise placement. And in this case, you get a nice circumferential compression of that repair. Here's the MRI comparison uh, showing complete healing uh, with nice res resolution and restoration of that circumferential rim. We looked at our clinical results. We compared 24 of our radial repairs to our traditional bucket handle tears. And we found that at three and a half years, there were no difference in pain scores, return to function, and overall return to sport. Here's a little bit more, more of a complex case. If you have a radial tear on the lateral meniscus, what happens is that posterior leaflet will spring back through the popliteus hiatus because of the absence of capsular attachments. So in this case, even when you pull on it, there's significant tension. So here we'll use a hybrid construct. We're replacing ripstop 2-0 sutures using the knee scorpion. We'll then perform circumferential compression using our inside-out technique. So you can see our final repair construct. And we also restore the cartilage in this case with an osteochondral allograft. Similar case. Lateral meniscus radial tear at five weeks. Again, you see gapping at the tear site. Here we'll place our ripstop sutures and we're using the mini suture tape in order to get our circumferential compression. In closing, I'll just say, how do we define success after meniscal repair? Here's a nice study looking at 295 meniscus repairs. 19 of these repairs failed. However, 75% of these cases they actually removed less meniscus tissue than they would have with index meniscectomy. So in conclusion, it's important to save as much native meniscus as possible. Remember your ABCs of meniscus repair with anatomic reduction, biologic preparation, circumferential compression. Inside out repair has always been the gold standard for meniscus repair, but the zone navigator now makes it easier. Thank you.